Okay, I'm going to proceed. So I would like to welcome people to our first webinar of this season. Uh, we are so pleased to be able to do this again. Uh, this is the second series that we have done. We've had quite a bit of experience with putting this webinar on um, there are always a few glitches so if you have any trouble please use your um, chat i suppose to let christian peterson know who's the whiz behind this and uh leslie and i leslie rattan and i are the main players tonight and i'm going to introduce leslie at the end of my of my talk. So welcome everybody. And I guess the first thing I wanted to talk to you about is the fact that we have a team uh, of people involved here. In fact, this is just a smattering of the team. And you, you can see how multidisciplinary it is that we have uh, neurologists, neuropsychologists, uh, a pain expert, a social worker, a nurse practitioner, a radiologist, uh, et cetera. So it's a big team of people that is here to help people recover from concussion and at the same time, try to make gains in what we know about concussion. And that's one of the things I would like to tell you about. So we have made this series free because we have a sponsor and i and you know terrific uh support we've received from liuna the labor's international union of north america has allowed us to put on these webinars every two weeks except for a break in the summer when we start all over again as a reminder, it's every other Tuesday at six o'clock, but you can look at them at your leisure on our website because they will all be posted on our website. And in fact, all the ones from the previous series are up. And as we move through the present series, we'll replace the ones that are on our website with the new ones. Because one thing about concussion, is that it's a fast moving field now. We're learning more about it. The webinars have been wildly popular and we're delighted that people have benefited from watching them. So we now have people watching from across our country and in other countries as well. So we must have something uh, that's helpful to people. So, this schedule it's a little bit blurry on my screen but you can see the next one is on september 27 and um, it's on the um, different aspects of the concussion spectrum by my colleague carmela tartaglia and so on um, so please help us advertise this send this to people that you know might benefit from it. Um, we're happy to have everybody on board. And we're going to try to tell you what is new in the treatment of concussions. Um, and Leslie is our moderator for all of them. And you'll be in, you'll be introduced to her at the end. And you can see that we'll be covering exercise therapy, vestibular therapy, mental health, return to work, school, athletics, and more. So we cover many aspects of concussion. And we want to be useful to both people who have had the experience, so-called lived experience of concussion, and also to their families and friends and caregivers. and any healthcare professionals who they come in contact with who, who you think would benefit from watching this series. And 
I really like this flyer that was created specifically for us. And in fact, the flyer was created by someone with lived experience of concussion. And she said, you know, I don't like the um, way you advertise. And so I'm going to do a better one for you. And she came up with this one, which I just love. I think it's great. So if you have suggestions for us, uh, please write to us with your suggestions. We're very keen to make this as useful as possible. And just my personal journey with concussion, I've now been focused on this for about 22 years since I wrote my first paper on concussion. And we have created this concussion center a long time ago. We did call it something else. Um, we called it the Canadian Sport Con Concussion Research Center or something like that. But it's been clear to us from for a long time that we are now focused on all kinds, uh, all mechanisms of concussion. Uh, a message that I think is worthwhile repeating over and over again is the importance of preventing concussion. And that's really where I started um, in an organization called Think First Canada, which lasted for about uh, 20 years and was involved mainly with uh, children and youth. But now uh, we merged into an organization in 2012 called Parachute Canada, which is Canada's National Injury Prevention Agency. And it has many good things about concussion on its website. So parachutecanada.ca is a great website for additional material on concussion. Uh, a number of achievements that we're very proud of, a number of uh, contributions to knowledge that we have created. In other words, about 50 journal articles we've written about concussion, trying to bring everybody up to speed about concussion. We had our ninth annual concussion research symposium last spring. We have a chair, in other words, a research chair in concussion, which is held by Carmela Tartaglia, who will be speaking to you next week. That's a big achievement for us. We have actually fundraised quite extensively to support this effort. And we've raised about $10 million over the last several years. We try to teach other healthcare professionals about concussion. So we have a concussion fellowship. We put on public forums and we have educational sessions for other professionals such as lawyers, and insurers, because we we have the goal of bringing everybody up to speed about concussion. It makes it easier to treat you people um, if everybody that you encounter, whether it's in a lawyer or, or an insurer, knows something about concussion. We want everybody to be able to recognize when somebody's had a concussion, and this is. Really, I, I entitled this The Concussion um, World Has Changed as and said it's like a concussion revolution. So to me, it's like a revolution because 20 years ago, people just didn't recognize concussion as being an important healthcare uh, issue, but they do now. And in fact, there is now a concussion law in Ontario which is really amazing to me, but it is an indication that we have made it in terms of making people aware. And the diagnosis of concussion, though, even though we want everybody to know something about concussion, the people who make the diagnosis should still be medical doctors and nurses in our view and not other healthcare professionals. Other healthcare professionals play a major role as we will learn all through this. And in fact, the treatment of concussion, as I've indicated here, 
does require a multidisciplinary team. And we want everybody to be up to speed. And um, so there's quite a bit of knowledge translation that goes on to try to make sure that findings are recognized by everybody. Your government does recognize the importance of concussion. That's been very heartening to us in the field. So FAC stands for the Public Health Agency of Canada, and they were very instrumental in harmonizing the way sport concussions are managed in our country and gave that responsibility to Parachute Canada, which published a harmonized guideline that's available for anybody to look at on the Parachute uh, website. And in fact, the government has published a memorandum called PPM 158, which we just spent about five years uh, analyzing the effectiveness of it. Uh, it came out in 2014 and was one of the reasons why Ontario developed Rowan's Law in 2018 with reiterations of it in 2020. And now again, in 2022, there's further information about Rowan's Law, who it covers. And it now does cover people, for example, who are adults. It's not only, it's not only for children and youth. And very importantly, we now have in our country, a Canadian concussion network as of 2020, which, you know, like the cancer network or heart disease. So now concussion is important enough that it's been recognized that we should have a network that brings people together, that helps disseminate knowledge. Uh, concussion prevention always needs emphasis. And we recognize the number of mechanisms of concussion. As I mentioned before, it's not just sport concussion, but it's those concussions that occur in motor vehicle crashes, in falls among seniors and unfortunately in intimate partner violence concussions are all too frequent and then concussions at work so concussions have many different causes not just sports and recreation and we on our center tries to deal with all of them uh, i'm reminded of the importance 20 years ago of the Canadian Academy of Sport and Exercise Medicine. That's what CASM stands for. And they came out with a revolutionary uh, doctrine that all players suspected of a concussion should leave the game and be examined by a medical doctor. That was absolutely revolutionary. And then other things that have come along that have uh, created prevention of concussion. For example, motor vehicles, the seat belts, the airbags are all designed to prevent uh, concussions, although there are still far too many concussions in motor vehicle crashes. And that's something that we are doing research in. False prevention is a huge issue among seniors. And there is there are now many false prevention activities going on in our country, even in my office, where I often uh, remind people, if you're unsteady on your feet, don't be proud, use a cane. It's very important if you've had a concussion to prevent the next one. Concussions are cumulative. Many discoveries from concussion research have infiltrated into concussion management. Uh, we now have much better definitions of concussion so that there's less uncertainty about whether a person has had a concussion. Uh, we hope that you don't have the experience of going to one doctor who says, yes, that's a concussion. And then you go to somebody else and they say, no, that wasn't a concussion. That doesn't happen as much as it used to. Everybody agrees now that concussion is a brain injury. It's not a ding, it's not seeing stars. 
it is a brain injury. And it's still referred to in many uh, circles as mild traumatic brain injury. We don't particularly like that term because when symptoms can last months or sometimes even years, it's just not useful to call it mild. So we prefer the term concussion. And we've learned quite a bit about a gender difference with respect to concussion, that women do concuss more easily and take longer to recover. We don't have it worked out why that is. We think that maybe susceptibility to concussion has something to do with neck muscles not being strong enough in many women. So for example, women hockey players now do specific neck muscle strengthening exercise as a prevention measure. So I mentioned, let's get rid of the term uh, MTBI or mild uh, brain injury because there's nothing mild about these injuries when they last so long. And uh, so let's uh, stick with concussion. We've asked all the speakers, for example, in this series, don't confuse people by using different terms for what we're talking about. It is concussion, it is a brain injury. Um, let's talk about what has happened in the world again. We have several journals. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? I, I'm really amazing that there are now three journals in which concussion is the focus. Uh, no one would have ever thought that that would happen. And the other thing is that, especially you learn in this series that we're very keen to expose people who are not uh, recommending proven evidence-based treatments. We think they're hopeless, costly, time-consuming, and we should get rid of them. And you'll hear a lot about that as we go through. We mentioned already the multidisciplinary nature of the concussion treatment team. And the other thing we want to mention, not only is the team multidisciplinary in that it may have an occupational therapist. It may have a neurologist. It may have a, a, a physiotherapist, etc. The treatment prescribed has to be individualized. It is a concussion is a marvelous example of individualized medicine that one size does not fit all when it comes to treatment of concussion. Uh, I've mentioned most of this already. I do want to flag the important contribution that the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation has uh, made. And you can look at their guidelines for clinical management of concussion. There's a lot of good information for both practitioners and patients. In addition, our Canadian Concussion Center handbook can be downloaded from our website, or if you can't manage to, to do it, we can send you a hard copy. If that's more palatable for you, just let us know, because there's a lot of useful information in our uh, handbook. This is a picture of the cover and you see that it has about 29 pages of tips for how to manage the symptoms uh, of concussion. Just to remind you that it is the most common brain injury. Uh, in the province of Ontario alone, there are 150,000 concussions a year. Isn't that amazing that there are so many? And that's another warning to everybody on this call to try not to have another one. It's very easy to get another one. Once you've had 
your first, the second one can occur with less force. And in fact, may last longer than the first one. So emphasis on prevention one, once again. The knowledge of concussion has improved. So here are some changes that have occurred. We now recognize that most people, probably 75%, let's say, get over the symptoms of concussion in about 30 days. So that's the, that's the current uh, criterion, about 30 days. After 30 days, we call it post-concussion syndrome, or now in red, it's now known as persisting concussion symptoms. The people who adjudicate what to call things meet every few years, and they have changed the name from post-concussion syndrome to persisting concussion symptoms. We now recognize the psychological consequences of concussion. And in fact, when we did our own tally of this, we in our own records, we found that 35% of people who have persisting concussion symptoms, that means after one month, 35% uh, of them have some depression, anxiety, or panic attacks. And panic attacks are the same as PTSD. And then this, this problem that we have recognized for a long time, that if you have multiple concussions, especially as an athlete in collision sports, then that might lead to a condition called CTE, which is a type of brain degeneration. But what we have learned, and this is good news, is that it's extremely rare. Although we recognize it can happen, it is very rare. So the definition of concussion, immediate and temporary alteration of mental functioning. So the importance of mental functioning. And to remind you, you don't have to have a blow to the head to have a concussion. It can be a whiplash type of effect on the brain from a blow to the chest, for example. You can still get a concussion even if, the, even if there's no impact to the brain. We don't know the exact mechanism, but in physical terms, we think that it's due to rotational acceleration, which is like a jiggle of jello, um, or it can be linear acceleration, which means backwards and forwards uh, movement. And the, um, there may be a tearing or a swelling of the nerve fibers in the brain. Probably there's a lot of biochemistry to the injury. We know that it's not due to bleeding. The vast majority of people who have a concussion there's no bleeding or bruising of the brain. And it may be a network problem, whereas where um, con connections between nerve cells are the main uh, problem. So there are about 65 possible symptoms. And most people have between five and 10 symptoms, the commonest ones being uh, headaches, dizziness, uh, sensitivity to light. It's rare to lose uh, consciousness. And then I, as I mentioned this already, there is a cumulative effect. We now recognize that there is no good grading system. We can't say this was a grade one or grade two concussion, or this is a mild one, this is a severe one. We have no way to grade them. So Concussion is a concussion is a concussion, and it is still a clinical diagnosis. And by that, we mean it's based on the symptoms you have and the signs you show. And as I mentioned, there's a number of activities that can lead to concussion. Uh, I think we'll skip over this one. And this is the important one, again, that the 
absence of biomarkers makes it even more important for a thorough analysis of your symptoms and signs. So we don't have a blood test. We don't have even an imaging test. We don't have an MRI. We use MRI to rule out a more severe brain injury. Like this is a perfectly normal MRI that you're going to see in somebody who has had a concussion and this MRI is perfectly normal. So we often do an MRI to make sure that you haven't had a more severe brain injury. So that brings me to the end of this um, 30 minute or so introduction of uh, the concussion world to you. And I hope that uh, I've hit the highlights and that you have learned something and, and that you're keen to stick with us for at least some of the subsequent number of seminars, which I'm told is going to be larger, a larger number than the 26 we did in the last series, because we've added some additional uh, people to speak to you as we get more knowledge of concussion. And most importantly, this is Leslie Rattan, who is a psychologist doing neuropsychology and clinical psychology. And she has a PhD from York University. She's been working at the T Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, which is our sister organization. And many of our people on our team uh, originated at TRI. She's been working in, for a number of years in the concussion field. She's a member of our center and she has been the facilitator and commentator and moderator. She does a lot of things. She is a lot of legwork involved to uh, have people show up on time and on the right date uh, for their presentation. So a uh, great thank you to uh, Leslie Rattan for being involved in our workshops for so many years. Initially, when we had workshops in person, she was the point person, and now she's the point person again for our webinar uh, series. So thank you, Leslie, and um, over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Tatter. Uh, it's great to see so many people out tonight. Uh, welcome back if you've been with us before. Um, we are going to move into, um, for the remainder of the session till seven, there's an opportunity to ask uh, questions to Dr. Tatter. So I see that there's a few already. If you wanna ask a question, if you just go down, scroll down to sort of the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A, so just enter them there. Um, just before we do that though, we're just gonna run a quick poll. It's really helpful for us to get a sense of, of who is out there and, and who's watching. So Christian, if I can get you to put that poll up for people just to identify um, uh, who you are. Okay, great. So I think we'll we'll jump right into the questions. So uh, Dr. Tatter, we have one from Janine, and she's asking about the difference between concussion and whiplash. Uh, Janine, that's a great question. I'm pleased to try to answer that for you. 25 years ago, people were diagnosed with whiplash and virtually never with concussion. The medical profession and others were mistaken about what belonged to whiplash and what belonged to concussion. We have gradually figured that out. So, for example, dizziness is not a symptom of whiplash, but it's a symptom of concussion. And the reason why whiplash and concussion were confused is because the, the same mechanism can cause whiplash of the neck or in medical terms of the cervical spine, the same mechanism causes concussion of the brain. And those mechanisms are the ones that I mentioned, especially linear acceleration, which is like 
the to and fro motion of the head that happens if you stop your car quickly, your head goes forward and backwards. So that that's a whiplash effect. And that same whiplash mechanism can cause a whiplash of the neck and a concussion of the brain. So somebody did a study a while ago at um, Guelph University, a very good study, and showed that about 25% of people uh, who have concussion also have whiplash. And that's, that's, a, that's my own experience as well. So there's quite a bit of overlap. And if you have a lot of neck pain, as well as dizziness, headache, uh, computer screen intolerance, then you've probably had both a whiplash of your neck and a concussion of your brain. So I hope that answers it. Great, thank you. We have, there's a couple of questions just asking about the handbook. So you can actually access the handbook on the Canadian Concussion Center website. Um, you can also get a, a copy if you want actually a hard copy, maybe just email me at uh, leslie.rattan. Uh, maybe Christian, if you can put that in the chat, it's leslie.rattan at uhn.ca. And then we can arrange to get one to you. Um, Okay, Jacob is asking, is the severity of concussions altered depending on the nature of impacts? So for example, is someone more affected if the brain is shaken post loss of consciousness uh, versus one hit and over? I'm not sure whether he's talking about maybe, maybe in sports being hit. Well, the but, way we answer that, Jacob, is it's probably a more severe blow to the head that results in loss of consciousness than the one that doesn't cause loss of consciousness, probably. We don't know that for sure. Um, some people have uh, done research on that very topic and some have found yes, it takes longer to recover if there's been loss of consciousness than if there hasn't been loss of consciousness. So maybe the severity is slightly uh, more with loss of consciousness, but we don't know that for sure. We do almost always inquire if someone has had loss of consciousness, but uh, we're not really sure about that. Great, great, thank you. Anne asks, how hard a hit do you have to have to have a concussion? Uh, great question. And the answer is not that hard. Um, and we have people who tell us that, uh, you know, I was getting into my car and I banged my head on the uh, roof of the car as I was getting in just over the doorway of the car. And that can cause a concussion. You don't have to hit very hard to cause a concussion. And there's a great variation on the theme. I think people who, for example, excel in collision sports, like if you, if you become a professional football player, most likely your tolerance or all the hits to the head that you had as a kid growing up was greater than the tolerance of, the, of another kid who said, I'm never gonna play football. It hurts when I hit my head. Um, I think there's an individual susceptibility that um, is, is present. In general, it's thought that it should be about 50 G's force to cause a concussion, but that's a very rough estimate. And as I said, it varies from person to person. We do recognize that women concuss more easily than men. And as I mentioned, it may be that there's more excursion of the head on the trunk because the neck muscles tend to be thinner in women 
and they and it doesn't they don't click in and stop the movement if as if the as it does when the muscles are strong so that may be a reason for susceptibility but there is a variation from person to person okay thank you and on that note, I'm going to jump down to this one. How many concussions are too many to continue playing a sport or does it depend on the severity of the concussion? Uh, yes, it really does. In other words, this decision about whether to allow yourself to continue to get concussions uh, is a very difficult decision. In my, in my view, there are some important aspects of it. For example, if the MRI, after you've had two or three concussions, we almost always get an MRI. If they show any bleeding, if someone has had any bleeding as a result of a, of a blow to the head, I say it's time to hang up your cleats or it's time to put away your skates, never get another concussion. If a concussion affects your memory, my flag, the red flags go up in my brain. And I say to the person, you know, you're showing some memory loss. You couldn't remember all of the things that I asked you to remember and repeat back to me. Um, and if that happens and I say, it's time to seriously consider never having another concussion. Don't expose yourself to the risk of collision sports. Uh, if you've had, let's say five concussions and you're still totally intact, I may still recommend that after that many you might consider switching sports that we're very concerned that as the number of concussions goes up the potential for causing a permanent uh, symptom goes up for example the symptom of memory loss or the symptom of irritability or or the symptom of uh, headaches or balance trouble. Um, so I think you really have to return completely to baseline. In other words, all the symptoms should be gone for you to consider continuing on in a risk-taking uh, activity. Great, thank you. Sarah asks, what is the research on uh, fMRI, DTI, or spec scans to look at the connectivity issues? Uh, that's a great question. We are learning a lot about the connections that go on in the brain as a result of what's called functional MRI. Um, which is a way to examine the connections between um, nuclei in the brain or between cl clusters of nerve cells in the brain. There's an enormous amount of interconnectivity in the brain. And the latest research is that once we unravel that, we might have a better idea of a biomarker for concussion. It's, as, as far as I'm concerned, we're at the beginning of, the, of this serious examination of, of the connectome uh, of the brain. And I'm hopeful that it will help us unravel uh, some of the mysteries that, uh, that continue. We don't have solid evidence from structural MRI. So we've talked about functional MRI. Now we're talking about structural MRI, which is like the one I showed you. We've been looking at the structural MRI of concussed people for 20 years, and we don't have a good handle on 
who's been concussed and who hasn't been. It just hasn't happened. Um, and in my view, it hasn't happened from a number, a number of other methods that have been used. I think you mentioned um, SPEC. Uh, and SPEC is a, a nuclear medicine test to essentially measure blood flow and metabolism of the brain. And it's the latest controversy in the imaging field. And there are some people, I've heard lectures on SPEC where the, the lecturer ends up by saying, now I have discovered what concussion looks like on a SPEC scan, but um, Nobody that I know of believes that nowadays. Um, maybe there's a little bit of information that's available by studying the metabolism through SPEC, but so far it does not count as a diagnostic test for concussion. And the same for computerized EEG. Uh, try as we might to use a simple thing like looking at the brain waves that go through the through the um, scalp. It would be easier on me than in than in Dr. Rutan, um, but it doesn't help. We can't diagnose concussion on the basis of EEG either. Uh, it's not for lack of looking, like there's an army of people out there now looking for the magic biomarker for concussion, but it has not happened yet. Great, thank you. David asks, is there any research on whether the history of concussion places people more at risk for long COVID and or uh, ME or CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome? I don't know of any connection except for the symptoms. And mm -hmm. that has led people to say, well, maybe there is a connection because some of the symptoms of long COVID are similar to the symptoms of concussion. But that's true of many other conditions. Uh, for example, the, the headaches of concussion can be very similar to the headaches of migraine. The, you know, the PTSD of concussion can be similar to the PTSD of, of blast injuries. So the lack of specificity, as they say, of the symptoms of a condition are, are a problem for us because it it can lead to errors in, in diagnosis, for example. Uh, but there is, you know, there, are, there is some commonality. The symptoms of concussion are not specific to concussion by and large. Okay, thank you. Tiffany asks, have you seen any information or statistics on people with concussions and seizures? Um, yes. People who have seizures are more susceptible to concussion because they're falling. If you have the type of seizure where you lose consciousness and you fall, you can bang your head on the way down. So that is a risk factor. So, but it's amazing how, how often people don't get concussion as a result of losing consciousness from seizures. The other side of that question is, can a concussion cause what looks like a seizure? And the answer is yes, but only immediately after a concussion. Uh, and there's a, there's a term for that uh, post-convulsive seizure. Uh, there is a small percentage of people, probably 2% of people who have a concussion 
within a few seconds or maybe a minute or two, they can have what looks like an ordinary seizure, but then they never have another seizure. So that concussion in itself does not lead to epilepsy. We have spent quite a bit of effort sorting that out because we have um, an epileptologist on our team uh, because of that issue, uh, because it does come up as, as a diagnostic issue uh, in, in many people who have had that concussion and then very shortly after it looks like they've had a seizure. But then when we do EEGs on those people, for example, there's no evidence of any continuing epileptic activity. So I hope that answers that. Great, thank you. Uh, Nadine asks, what post-concussion symptoms can you work through versus symptoms that indicate you should, should actually take a break? That's an important issue. And the way we answer that is to talk about the concept of a threshold. We like people really from the first day or two to be active. We don't put people in dark rooms anymore. We, in fact, do the opposite. We encourage both physical activity and mental activity. There's no benefit from being in a quiet, dark room. There is benefit from trying to be active. Now, we try to instruct people about the concept of a threshold. So the threshold is an increase in the activity level, whether it's mental activity or physical activity, to the point of bringing on symptoms. When you bring on a headache, or when you bring on dizziness, or when you bring on fogginess, or whatever your symptom complex is, that's when you should cut back. That means you have reached your threshold. The next time you do that activity, try to stay sub threshold. Try to go recognize that you're approaching your threshold, don't go over the threshold. Now, just like a lot of things in concussion, you will find some practitioners who say, oh, you can go way over your threshold and it doesn't matter. I haven't swallowed that one. I still think it's good to respect your threshold. I don't think there's any evidence that going way over your threshold is going to make you recover faster. In fact, I think it's going to make you recover more slowly. So I try to teach people to learn to recognize where their threshold is. And there will be like each, each of us has thousands of thresholds because we're doing all kinds of different things. So there's going to be a different threshold for you know looking at your cell phone another threshold for looking at your computer another threshold for reading a book another threshold for walking fast etc cetera, etc cetera. so my view is try to recognize when you're precipitating symptoms by doing too much right Bridget asks, given how concussion is so multifaceted, uh, do you have general recommendations on what the rehab pathway should look like? <laughs> that's, that's a lovely question. question. And in fact, uh, I was going to show a slide that came to us from, from a researcher in Denmark. In fact, she heard from one of her patients about our series and she got in touch with us. And it so happened that she's an expert on concussion. And she gave us the most fantastic slide of the pathways. And 
the pathways are all over the place. Uh, like the pathway to getting better is not one single pathway. It's multiple pathways. And we try to make them as direct as possible and as interconnected as possible, but very often they aren't. And the pathway is often dependent on how you got the concussion. In other words, if you got the concussion, as let's say a high school athlete, you'll have advice from the coach. You may have advice from the teacher. You may have uh, advice from your family doctor, et cetera, et cetera. And there may be variations of, of opinion. If you got your injury at work, then your boss may weigh in and give his or her advice about what to do. And then you may have, uh, you know, your insurer, your lawyer uh, weigh in on how the pathway should look. It should be multidisciplinary and it should be with people who are experienced. And, you know, this is, this is the subject of a couple of talks that we have in this series about, you know, how to figure out who to go to. Uh, because unfortunately, there are a lot of blind alleys and people are recommending things like if you look it up on the Internet, it's a bewildering array of advice and it's not all correct. So I sympathize with you when you ask that question. We try to make the pathway as as evidence based as possible. And to involve, but it often is multidisciplinary, as I mentioned. In other words, if you're if you're thinking of how to get back to work, you may need an occupational therapist. If you have an associated whiplash injury of your cervical spine, you may need a physiotherapist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you have significant PTSD then you're probably going to need a psychiatrist. So it's a very multifaceted pathway. Yeah. Great. I'm just conscious of the time and I don't think we're going to get through all the questions. We do have the next question is asking about a nurse being able to diagnose a concussion. And I was just going back to double check. It's actually nurse practitioner. So it's not just any nurse. This person was saying, um, they were diagnosed or suggested by their sports chiropractor. Um, but in the ONF guidelines, anyway, it indicates physicians and, and nurse practitioners. So, um, Carla asks, I'm over two years concussed. When I'm in a loud environment, I have brutal concussion, fog, and headache symptoms for about two weeks. Is this normal? Uh, I would say perfectly normal. Uh, as an example of how to be in overload, that excess noise can do it, bright lights can do it, a uh, combination of noise and lights can do it, physical activity can do it, too much computer time can do it. All of these things can put you into overload, even though it's two years from the time of your concussion. The rate of recovery is very individual, depending on you know, how, how big the force was, how many concussions you've had, uh, et cetera. So not uncommon. Okay, great. Um, Dave asks, two years after a bad bicycling accident that sheared my brain, he says, I don't remember the proper term, and titanium on my neck, should I expect a recovery on my memory and mood management, or should I accept that this is the future? No, I don't think you have to accept that this is the way you're going to be forever. 
we have people who continue to recover for several years. Uh, there is always more recovery that you can achieve. It, it tends to slow down after six months, 12 months, but there are still gains to be made years later. So I would try to stay optimistic, follow the rules, figure out where your thresholds are, emphasize the things that don't bring on symptoms. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, maybe we'll do, let's see, one more. Um, Stacy Ash, she says, I'm five years in, I've had a lot of different therapies, including vision therapy, I have light sensitivity. My question is why does bright light put me to sleep or why does bright sunlight through the trees suddenly make me dizzy? <laughs> uh, you know, that is uh, something we have not figured out. The light pathway in the brain is one of the most complex pathways. In fact, a good deal of the brain function is related to vision. Vision occupies a big part of brain activity. So, you know, even though the light goes in through the eyes, it activates a huge part of the brain. We have identified a number of factors. Like we, we now know that there are direct pathways, a direct neurological pathway from the retina of the eye through the optic nerves, through the brain stem, and then um, it ends up in the thalamus of the brain. And the thalamus of the brain is the pain center. So a bright light can indeed be painful. And usually the pain is quite fast because that pathway is a rapidly conducting pathway in the brain. So it doesn't happen an hour later, it can happen just even a second later that a bright light can be painful. So there are a number of strategies like using sunglasses, turn the light down on your computer. Don't go into rooms with fluorescent lights. Fluorescent lights are extremely bothersome. Go, to, go back to the old incandescent light bulbs. Uh, Elton John type sunglasses are the best because they block the ambient light. You know, those are the glasses that make you look like, a, like an insect with big eyes because they block out the ambient light that comes in from below and from above and from the side. Um, so, and the color of sunglasses is important. Like gray glasses, blue glasses are no good. Black glasses, no good. Uh, orange is good. Brown is good. So an optometrist can help sort out which colors you're more sensitive to. And do you need blue light filtering glasses? If you're in front of a, of a computer screen, for example, you change the, change the, the color with F, F dot Lux, L-U-X. Great program to change the color of the screen. Microsoft Blue is one of the most aggravating colors for someone who's had a concussion. So we have learned a fair amount about it. We're, there's more to be learned. We haven't got it all figured out. In fact, we have a research project starting shortly on uh, a new type of computer screen that's supposed to be less aggravating to the brain. So if you ask me that question in a few months, I'll tell you whether to buy it or not. Great. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Tatter. It looks like we've, we've run a little bit over time and there's so many really great questions. I'm sorry that we can't get to all of them. 
but I would encourage you to, if you have the time to, to come back and you can bring your questions back with you. Um, Dr. Carmela Tar uh, Teglia will be with us in two weeks uh, back here at the same time at 6 p.m. on the 27th. And just as a reminder, there'll, there'll be a short survey that will come to you. So if you have, it won't take any longer than two minutes. If you can uh, fill that out, we really appreciate your suggestions and, and uh, any uh, feedback that you might want to share. Um, so I think with that, uh, I'll say thank you very much and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, Leslie. Okay.